So welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Match Fit Football Podcast. I'm Darren Potts, your host, and today I'm joined by a very special guest. A warm welcome to Kelsey Minnie. Kelsey, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. My pleasure. Delighted to get you on here. And obviously, you're a footballer. Um, you've played football all your life. And, you know, we, we gear this show to encourage and to equip and to give some advice to young people wanting to follow in the footsteps and become a professional footballer. So I want to really kind of start out with a little bit about your journey is, you know, you've you've obviously played football all your life and your youth career coming up through the academy at Aston Villa. So tell me a little bit about your journey um, so far and um, what it was like for you growing up playing football. And was the dream always to be a professional footballer? When did that become something you kind of set out to actually achieve? It depends how far you want to go back because I could go back all the way to when I was a kid, when I first joined Villa. Um, that far back was... I joined Villa when I was eight, um, so I joined it. Can't sign contract back then, uh, but I joined then for my Sunday league team, um, and it was just one of them things where I've joined there, and it was kind of just the dream was from since I could remember I had my first football kit was to be a pro, and you know to do it from staying in one place the entire time was was you know it's very rare to be fair, so. And what that was, was kind of the beginning of it. What was that like for you coming in? Because if you're if you're joining from say a Sunday league side and you're going into an academy by Aston Villa, was obviously that was very different for you. Um, was there a lot yeah. of structure? And if if so, in regards to that structure, how did you adapt to that at that young age? From what I can remember at that at the age, uh, it was like I was going from playing with my mates, and then I think there was four of us that went from this one Sunday league team. It was a uh, Bimbrook um, was signed from there and we all went into Villa. Um, and then luckily, to be fair, there's probably three of us who stayed until we were like 20, 21. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of unheard of a little bit. But at the time, like the structure was good. It was like the, it was like coaches who were just like, like getting you to still enjoy your football. Whereas like... Uh, and like nowadays you kind of see people putting pressure on kids at that age and it's like just let them enjoy let them play their football and was that something that you noticed right away or is that something in hindsight you're looking back at and kind of thankful that it was about enjoying the football rather than the pressure looking back at it now i mean at the time i guess i felt a little bit of pressure but it's no it's nothing to what obviously you experience like nowadays um and like I'm thankful looking back at it. It's like both like my family and the coaches that I had surrounding me who stick with me for like many years. That are like thankfully they they stood by me and just supported me. And even coming up through the academy, was the goal always to get playing for the next team up, or was there something about developing at the same time, or was there always a conscious decision, conscious focus of I want to get higher and higher and higher until I make the first team? Uh, for me, it was more of just. Well, I say back then I didn't have the same mindset that, that I have now. Mm-hmm. And if I could tell myself these are the things that I know now, then it might have, I might have written a different story. But for like back then, it was kind of just, I need to play in the first team now. I need to do this now. And it was like kind of had the lack of patience a little bit. And uh, and I'll, I'll be the first one to say that I was lucky uh, a few occasions to, you know, because obviously you don't sign contracts, but it's like you stay on for an extra year or another year and a half or something like that. There was a few times where I felt like I was lucky to, to stay on. And what happened at those times whenever you said you felt lucky to stay on? Did you see that as another opportunity? Did, did that encourage you in terms of your work rate, your development? Um, what way did you interpret though, those feelings at that time? So it was kind of like, uh, I remember that the specific times that it happens, it's like, you go into the, the office with like an academy manager or something like that and he'll sit you down and either obviously say like, sorry, we're going to have to let you go or like, well done, you've worked hard and we're going to keep you on for another year type thing. And I remember like going, I, I know when I was going into a meeting thinking I, I, I've done everything I can, I like, it'd be very, very strange of me to not be staying on here. Then there was other times where it was like, I really don't know what's going on here. Like, I have no idea. And then he'd say to me, yeah, you, you, like we're keeping on you for another year, another year, and it should be a big like sigh of relief kind of thing. 
And is that something you think, again, looking back, that's good for a young person to feel that pressure and, and to go into that environment? Or do you think that's something that maybe is a bit harsh, perhaps, for a young person to be involved in that? Or is that almost the nature of the beast of competitive football? There's two sides of the story, I'd say. I'd say one of them is kind of you're gearing up to become, to be in this nature that's so cutthroat and you, when you're older, you're kind of getting ready for it. And then the other side of it, you could say, you know, you're a, you're a 12 year old boy and they're making the same decisions for if you're 20, 23. Um, and it's like a 12 year old boy is going into a meeting by himself, by the way. And he's got an academy manager or a manager saying to him, sorry, you're not good enough. You, you've got to leave this club. Um, and I just think that could, that could probably ruin a lot of, a lot of boys careers. Cause if you go from that and you get told you're not good enough, at that age, do you really have the mindset where you're going to go, all right, I'm going to prove you wrong? Or it's not it, it's not very common, is it? So you see a lot, of, a lot of boys drop out the game at your age. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we've seen so many stories over the years of different players who maybe have had to overcome that rejection. And a lot of football is that mental side of the game as well. Um, speaking of sort of your experience, what's the difference or is there a grey area between development and winning at that age? And how do you overcome that how do you differentiate between those two as a player in that academy for me and my personal experience there's there's what people say and there's other things so if you've got an academy manager saying to you that like for example 18 well before 18 there's no league so 18 is when you start got playing competitive games in an, in an academy and then you've got coach is saying to you right we need to win this game we need to win the youth cup or whatever it is um and then you've got other coaches saying to me no just you need to work on this in your game work on this in your game and you'll progress and it's like you kind of get getting messages from all over the place a little bit it's obviously something very very difficult to deal with i think there's just as you say just a lot of voices as a kid at that young age and when yeah. you're that when you're that age as well you know i say it respectfully but kids are impressionable you know and they take different things from different people and it's that's probably part of the challenge of the mental challenge of being a part of maybe an academy system as well not just the physical demands it's those mental demands and um, we're going to talk slightly now about about the mindset how important is it for a professional footballer in your opinion to, to be strong mentally and have that strong mindset i'd say it's more important than anything else within the game um other people's opinions may differ but I think you can have all the talent in the world and if mentally you're not prepared for what's going to get thrown at you is you, you're going to struggle a little bit um you could I've played with a lot of players that technically are better than me I'll be the first one to admit that who haven't even played professionally um so it's one of them things where and granted I'm I'm still young so I'm still learning it myself but even if I go back to when I was first released from Villa as like a 20 year old kid and I call myself a kid because I feel like I've grown up massively in the three years since then. Um, but if I could tell him things that I know now, I feel like it could have been a lot different. Is it important to know when you're released from a club, so say a Villa let you go or any Premier League team's academy let you go, is it important for a young person and a young player to know that that doesn't have to be the end? Because that rejection can destroy people. You know, from, from your experience, how do you get over that feeling and how do you get going again, so to speak? Well, if I'm talking from now, uh, then it's hindsight's a different thing. But if I'm talking from when it happened to me, I'll be the first one to admit openly I struggled massively mentally once I got released from Villa. And I wouldn't ever, have ever talked about this at the time. But now it's like one of them things where I'll, I'll openly talk about it to anyone just because it, if it helps someone and then that makes me happier. Um, like at the time I was, I remember I got told that I was getting released after I'd been on loan, done well, done well in the 23s, so and so. Um, and it, I was like 95% sure. I was like, yeah, I'm going to get like a longer term deal. I'm going to be like one of the main men's type thing. Um, and then I just got told, no, sorry, you're not good enough. You've got to go. And I was like, okay, this is the first time I'd ever experienced reject rejection in my life. Um, because from eight until 20, that, that was 
I've been like comfortable. I'm part of the furniture at Aston Villa. And then when I got told that, I struggled for a good probably six months, mm-hmm. to be honest with you. Um, and then even beyond that, I was still getting my head around it. Um, but it's like the only way from looking at it from my perspective now, the only way you're going to get through it is if you treat that as if it's someone's opinion. And if you don't believe that you're better than that, you wouldn't have been there in the first place. So I believe at the time that I was one of the best players, like other people's opinions might be completely different. And obviously they were, so I didn't get kept on. But if I didn't, once I'd left, I believed in myself, so I kept going. That I think that self belief is the biggest thing that you've got to, no matter what situation, but especially when you get told no and like you get you get rejected, that self belief is the only thing that's going to keep you going. I think. I think that's massive, isn't it? You know, self belief and the awareness of the ability that you have. And you said something in there which I thought was phenomenal. You mentioned it was someone's opinion. At the end of the day, football is about opinions. We've seen some of the best players in the world be sold by some of the top managers in the world, and it's came back to you know bite yeah. them on the backside and stuff. You know, and football is just a massive game, obviously, of talent and of ability and of ma- mentality and mindset. But a lot of football at the same time is opinion. And I think that's vitally important f- for someone to understand and for our listeners to understand these get these young guys, the young girls who want to go professional. The rejection sometimes is an opinion and it's something that you can overcome. And it's something on your journey you can look back at and say, this happened to me and I overcame it. And obviously your career continued. And you're still playing today. You're still scoring today. The life is still good for you today. Um, talk to me about the goals for the future. Then you know you've been, you've had the taste of academy football. You've dropped down the leagues. You're playing well. You're scoring goals. What's the future hold for you, or what would you like the future to hold for you? For me, it's like at the minute, it's the happiest I've been since I left Villa because of how much I struggled. I openly talk about it how much I struggled once I actually left. I was kind of like started doubting my own ability a little bit. Um, and then when I, once I went back into a, a first team environment, back into the league as a pro last year, it was one of them things where I, the exact same thing happened to me again, where it was just my face didn't fit. It was as simple as that. So then I just thought, all right, okay. So then I've dropped, I've dropped back down, gone back into, into the conference and it's like, I'm enjoying my football more than I ever have, I'll be perfectly honest with you. Um, it's just, for me, it's being, I'm happy. And when I'm happy, that's the best that I'm going to play. Mm-hmm. And in the future, I think if I can carry on doing what I do and score a few more goals, then the aim for me is to get back and prove people wrong who've mm-hmm. said no to me beforehand. It's that simple. One of the major things I like to ask my guests when they're on the show is about their motivating factors. You know, you've mentioned something there, you're happy, you're enjoying your football, but you're also motivated to prove people wrong that have maybe released you or let you go or felt you didn't fit in, et cetera. And what other motivating factors do you have in your life that push you to want to do football, to to be, you know, as quality and as elite a player as you can be? Motivating factors, I'd say, you, you're going away from the obvious ones like uh, fame and money and that type of thing. That's just, that's what everyone would say. And I, I think for me, it's like the only thing that I'd want to see is I want to go back to a level where I was playing at and I want to play against a manager or a coach or someone who said to me before, no, you're not good enough. And then I can then look them in the eyes and say, no, you were wrong. For me, that's the motivating factor. And also being a forward as well, a striker, um, is there a desire to be scoring? Obviously, there will be being a forward, a desire to score lots of goals. But is that a motivating factor, you know, to be top goal scorer, to be a goal scorer? Or is there more of a team focus and a, a team atmosphere type environment for you? Um, tell me what it's like being a striker, because a lot of people believe and talk about strikers need to be greedy they need to be selfish but how does that play into a team environment for you i think that's it's fairly obvious as a number nine you want to be scoring goals you want to be selfish and you want to be doing that type of thing but i think what doesn't get talked about enough is everything else within the game um so like you hold a play bringing other players into play your all-round play that's not on a stat sheet 
I think that's the most important to our say. I'm not going to say it's more important than scoring goals because that's a bit ridiculous. I think that is important and it doesn't get talked about enough. Um, so I think scoring goals is great, but when you're in a winning dressing room, I don't think there's anything better than it. I've I've heard that from quite a lot of our guests. They talk about the atmosphere in a team and the team changing room and you know just having that bond with the players that you play with. And obviously with goal scoring, with scoring goals comes confidence. How important is confidence, not just to a striker, but to a football player? Well, I'll, I'll talk from my perspective. It's the most important thing in the game. So it's it's up there with your self-belief. It's the mental side of the game where you can't, if there was a recipe for confidence, anyone would be at the top level because I feel like if you've got some sort of talent and you're confident and you believe in yourself, you can go to wherever you want to be. So a confident, it just feels like you can do anything. I'll be perfectly honest with you. The best way I can describe it is if you're like scoring, it's as if the goal just gets 10 times bigger for a striker's perspective, that is. Um, And it's like, Anything that anytime you're in and around the box, you just feel like you're going to score. Every time you step on the pitch, you feel like you're going to score. And with confidence, um, obviously, that's when the goals come. That's when, like you said, the, the goals look bigger. Everything looks easier. Everything comes to you easier. Your natural instincts, things just click and work for you every time. When things aren't going as well, is there a feeling of pressure that you need to get it right? That you this next shot needs to go in, or and well, maybe and. If there is that feeling of pressure, how do you deal with that pressure? I'm going to speak from my perspective. So if you like, I have certain techniques that I use that probably no one who has ever played with me has noticed. Um, it's like little things. So like if I'm not confident or if I'm confident or not, if I miss a chance, um, I'll like kind of like reset myself and then take it taking like four deep breaths and like when I breathing I like tense all my body it'll, it'll look ridiculous if, if anyone notices that but I do the same thing after every every time I like miss a chance or do something that disappoints me it's kind of like a like a mental reset for me um so that there's like a technique that I use when I do it um but also it's like it's one of them things where if you carry on doing the right things and I'm still learning this I get frustrated with myself uh if you carry on doing the right things I'm a firm believer that eventually your rewards will come mm-hmm. so if you don't get fed up with yourself you keep doing the right things your rewards will come absolutely echo that as well you know you do the right things you train well you work hard you give 100 percent. the reward will come 100 percent. i mentioned you know the word pressure there and obviously your dad tommy mooney had a phenomenal football career as well um as a son of a of a former professional player do does that add any pressure to you and do you feel maybe from the outside from peers from teammates that they have an expectation from you because of who your dad is and if so how would you deal with that maybe a little bit uh but like it's something that i've dealt with my whole life so yeah. maybe now it's just like a subconscious thing that i don't really think about like if someone like makes a joke so I'll be like in training at the Lazarus banter and just saying like, oh, your dad has scored that. Like it's it's just one of them things. Like I'm used to it. I'm absolutely fine with it. You know, it's like he taught me a lot of what I know, and it's to the point where now where he just he comes to my matches and he just lets me and just watches me play. Mm-hmm. He doesn't like give me like shouting at me or like after the game he's like grilling me saying you should have done this, you should have done this. We, we spoke about it and it's just like, I just enjoy watching you enjoying yourself playing your football now. And like that, that pleases me as well. Well, that's, that's a phenomenal relationship to have, you know, that it's almost that unique family bond rather than a coach bond, which probably a lot of people maybe assume because your dad's been a yeah. performer player that he's going to be like this coach grilling you all the time. But it's kind of nice to have yeah. that someone who's just going to come and encourage you and watch you and, and cheer you on in that aspect. And we're going to touch on the match fit performance section of the podcast. And um, one of the things I like to ask is what, in your opinion, what are the keys to elite performance? Are you still talking in terms of mental sides or? Physical, physical. Let's do match preparation. So if, if I said you have a cup final at the weekend, what are the keys to yeah. um, that elite performance and being at your top level, ready to go for the game at the weekends? Uh, so I'm not a superstitious person, but I just have little routines that I go through. So like the day before a game, I'll eat the same meal that 
I'd have eaten for the last week and week gone before that. Um, and then I'd have on the evening, um, I stretch before I go to bed. Uh, I'm a strange one. So if I have an away game, I go to bed fairly late because I like to sleep on the coach on a way up to a game. Um, but beforehand, I'd have been kind of increasing my carbs a little bit on the day on the day leading up to the game. Um, and then on the morning of the game, I'll have my I'll have scrambled eggs with ham cheese on toast. That's mm. that's my staple breakfast. Those those nutritional aspects obviously are so important, you know, as well. You know, hydration, yeah. sleep, the right foods. Is there any supplements you would take that help? aid in and perhaps you know your physical development i've kind of like tried and tested a lot of things because i've always been into the fitness side of the game mm -hmm. like uh overall like nutrition and supplements and try, so i've tried your know, creatines your bcaa's amino acids everything like that um and the only thing for me that i take at the minute that works for me is just protein uh Creatine, I dabble with sometimes, but I've never really got it down to a structure. Uh, and then caffeine on match days, I'll have like caffeine tablet or a pre workout shot type of thing, like exactly an hour before kickoff. And you mentioned earlier, you know, you're quite structured and you quite like doing the same thing. So, in, in terms of that, in terms of the nutritional side, is that and the supplemental side, is that easy enough for you to, to handle and to keep a you know a firm grasp on because of the way you're structured yeah it's i guess no one would have ever noticed it but in my head i have little things like that mm -hmm. so like my pre-workout shot i have to have exactly an hour before the game uh my meal i have probably three and a half hours before kickoff and i don't like to have too much because i don't like to feel too heavy um but for me it's just that routine is one less thing to think about type of thing so it's like, I'm never thinking of when am I going to have my breakfast? When I, have, like, I know exactly what I'm doing so I can just focus on my game. The fight, vitally important, isn't it? You know, you're focusing on the game and everything else is kind of taken care of because of that routine and that structure that you have in your life. I even talk to me a little bit about, about football training, um, about that extra 1%. And I love asking people about the extra 1%. Is there anything that you do maybe outside of your team training, outside of your corporate training environment that you feel helps give you an edge or you you have done in the past to improve a certain area and you've seen it work? Probably two things. Uh, one thing that I've only got good at within the last probably year and a half, I'd say. So last year I struggled with hamstring issues. Um, so like I've, I always probably three times a week I'll go into the gym just to keep on top of my like my hamstring strengthening work. Um, so that's helped me massively. I've, I haven't touched wood, haven't had any problems with them since. Um, and then also uh, I used to have problems with my knees. So uh, there's a guy called Knees Over Toes um, that I've, I've been following religiously. Uh, and it's all about like body weight, functional fitness, kind of uh, flexibility type type stuff. And honestly, it's been brilliant. So for me, that's the, the one thing I, re I would recommend. Yeah. I've actually heard about that from several other people on various different podcasts and platforms from NFL players to MMA athletes talking about knees over toes. Um, yeah. Just of how good and how helpful, you know, that particular workout is. Um, talk to me a little bit about role models in your life. Did you have any particular role models or anyone that you looked up to or perhaps when you're in the academy, did you have a mentor? Um, and if so, what was that like or was it very much just a subconscious kind of thing? Uh, well, the obvious role model would be my dad because um, obviously like growing up, uh, I did, I was obsessed with football because it's all I knew, really. He was kind of in the prime of his career when I was a young boy. Um, I used to go to training with him whenever we were off off school uh when it was i used to go to matches with him and sit in the dressing room beforehand while everyone's getting prepared for the game i'd just be sat there you know in a, in a team environment from as young as like six years old so it's everything i knew um and i guess in a way as well that's prepared me for like for me growing up and getting into the same environment a little bit but yeah my main one's definitely my dad and that environment, you know, you talked about being in that team environment and getting used to that team environment from when you grew up, you know, to go into it yourself as your own man and your own player. Um, what 
does that good environment, that team atmosphere, you know, even your current team, you know, you said you're enjoying your football the most that you've ever enjoyed it right now. What's the difference in the atmosphere right now and what's going on in your life right now compared to maybe other times in your career where it was tough and it was hard and you're overcoming rejection? As a group, I'd say the best group that I've had um, just because it's, you know, normally if you walk into a dressing room, you've got three or four tight knit groups, uh, and it's it's like it's fairly uh, normal. But within the group that I'm in now, it's kind of just everyone gets on with everyone. It's it's good, and uh, and obviously the manager the manager I'm with at the minute is probably the best manager I've worked under as well, and I think that's a big thing. And talk to me just slightly a bit, a little bit about a managerial presence in in your in your career so far you know you mentioned the manager right now is the best one you've worked under you're enjoying your football the most um is does there have to be two sides to a manager a side where he puts the arm around you and he encourages you and then the time where he puts the boot up the backside so to speak and as a player how do you react to those different sides of the manager i guess different players react to different things uh me personally i'd react to I mean, I'm, I'm my biggest critic and it's kind of a good thing and a bad thing at times because some people would say, oh, you were, you were great today, like you scored a great goal, whatever. And I'll be sat there thinking, I could have scored four. And I'm like fuming with myself. Um, but like a ma- the manager at the minute, in comparison to other managers that I've played under, the difference would be he knows you. He, he gets to know you as like a person on and off, on and off the pitch. So it's like, you can kind of relate to him a little bit rather than where I've been at other clubs. Uh, I won't name names, but there's just managers who are just completely segregate themselves from everything. And it's just, you do this now or you're not playing. You do it how I want it or you're not playing. And there's just no relationship between the two. So I think there's a, there is a, there's a little alleyway in the middle there where the manager should really stand and it could work. That relationship building, I think, is key. Um, you know, from the different people that I've talked to, from the various podcasts that we've done, you know, having a, a relationship doesn't even have to be a close relationship, but just having a relationship where you can have an open conversation, open dialogue with a member of the coaching staff, a manager, etc. It's so vital to having that harmonious dressing room and that confidence-filled dressing room. And players want to fight for each other. They want to play for each other, I feel, in that type of environment as well. Um, just as we begin to wrap this one up, um, if you could give one piece of advice um, to a young person or to a young person, a young player who is about to go professional or maybe is in the academy somewhere applying their trade, what piece of advice would you give them? I could say a lot of things that would probably help a younger me or a younger player like coming through. For one piece, I would say take it day by day. So one thing that I regret is... I always set from when I went first went into football was I want to be a professional footballer. I've reached that goal and I became stagnant a little bit. I'll openly say it for probably a nearly a year. It was like a three year contract. The first year I was pretty stagnant. So I was like, I've reached this massive goal that my whole life would be aiming to achieve. What do I do now? Um, so I think you reach that long term goal, then start start setting yourself short term ones. So It'd be training every day. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And then do that for every single day. I've, I've started doing it now. And it's just, it puts purpose in everything you're doing, I think. Phenomenal piece of advice. Phenomenal piece of advice. And just last question then, as, as, as we begin to wrap this up, when you go to training every day, you know, I've heard it said before, you know, you want to train how you play. How important is a professional approach to training and to pushing yourself to that optimal position so you can be at your best, not only for yourself, but for your team and for those fans that turn up every week? I think it's massively important. So if you think about, you know, there's some people that you hear about like, Edin Hazard that I've heard about, he's trained terrible all week and then he'll be the best player on pitch on, on a week. And that's, that's an anomaly, I think. So it's kind of like you're building the muscle memory in your body, if you like. So the way you train is when it comes to a match, match day, it's almost second nature. So if you're training, you're just walking about doing your own thing. Firstly, you're not learning anything and you're not progressing as a player. And secondly, you're not preparing yourself for the weekend. 
And that's the key thing, isn't it? You know, that preparation for the weekend, because that weekend you're going in, you're going to be competitive. You've got, you've got a center back who's going to run a run through you to get that ball. You're going to be holding that ball up against the guy who you need to maybe spin or you maybe need to take him on one on one and get the ball past him. And if you're lethargic and not really putting in the effort in training and he's killing himself, he's ready at that weekend. And maybe you're potentially not. I think it's so vitally important to take that professional approach to training, you know, for us of us normal people, and I like to say us normal people who work a day job, you know, if we just decided to come into work and not bother, and we'll say, oh, we'll try every Friday, you know, and uh, probably similar to a footballer, you know, if you come in and be not that bothered, but you'll try on a match day. I think eventually it's bound to catch up to you at some stage. 100%. 100%. I couldn't agree more. Well, Kelsey, this has been a really good conversation. I want to thank you for coming on the show today. And um, for our listeners who want to follow you, want to see what you're up to, maybe even want to DM you with some more questions, where can they find you on social media? Uh, so my socials, are Instagram, Kelsey Mooney. So K-E-L-S-E-Y, M-O-O-N-E-Y, an extra Y on the end. Um, and then Twitter, I don't really use it that much. I guess it's my name. I don't really use it that much, but to be honest. Well, that's for our listeners. Follow him on Instagram and search his name on Twitter and he's bound to appear going by that response. (laughs) He's there somewhere. You'll find him and give him a follow, see what he's up to. And I'm sure if if you want to drop him a DM and ask him any more questions or just say that you had a listen to the show, I'm sure he would appreciate that. But thank you so much for coming on the show today. This has been the Matchfit Football Podcast. I'm Darren Potts. This was Kelsey Booty. This has been a great episode as always. And we'll see you right here next week on the show.